Fair warning. Um, so first up, the assessment's been released. Uh, can show of hands, have you looked at it yet? All right, is anybody taking a pass at it yet? Like, can anybody start working on it yet? Okay, anybody finish? Sweet. All right, one thing I wanna mention is that um, I didn't really think about this when I put it in Gradescope. Um, the, like, so it's in Gradescope and that's where you read it to find out what to do, right? But at the same time, it's gonna make you like save it. Um, I'm not gonna review them until like the deadline. So if you need to, you know, if you submitted it or saved it or whatever, like that's totally fine. It's gonna, it should allow you to update any submission you already made. Uh, there shouldn't be any challenges like that. If you do have any problems, obviously let me know and we'll figure out whatever's wrong with it. Um, any questions so far about the assessment? All right, well, that's a good sign. Apparently it's clearly written. Um, I did make the uh, library, the uh, dependency challenge significantly simpler. Uh, so that it was, I think the vast majority of the office hours we spent last semester. So hopefully that'll be a, a little cleaner. Um, but I think that's all we have to say. Uh, all right, let's move on. Um, I made this awesome, awesome slide yesterday um, because Last semester, I had a student who uh, was running into challenges uh, that were largely because they didn't really understand how DNS worked from a kind of consumer perspective. Um, so I understand DNS is taught in a class here that is called networking. Um, how many people have taken that class? I don't know if it's prereq or not. It's the problem with like, I don't know all the numbers, but I know kind of vaguely what they teach, you know? Um, all right. So uh dns or domain name service um while not particularly interesting for the vast majority of computer users as a programmer who wants to do anything related to the internet it is quite important that you roughly understand how it works um and you know if you don't already that's totally fine it's relatively straightforward um, but if you don't like this, but if you don't know how it works, you're going to have a bad day. Uh, so that's why I put these slides together. So what I wanted to show was um, that the way it works is you have friendly names, right? So uh, are you familiar here with uh, the shared computing cluster? Anybody? All right. So there's a, a group within Boston University called the Research Computing Service. Um, and they basically support researchers with hardware, right? Um, the hardware that they supply comes from the shared computing cluster sometimes. Um, and I use it for one of my other classes, so I'm pretty familiar with it. But their domain name is scc.b. It's actually not, I think I had a typo and I forgot to fix it. But let's just say it's scc.bu.edu, okay? So the way that works is computers don't like letters, generally speaking, for things like addresses. So it does a conversion of that to a number, okay? And this number over here is called an IP address, uh, which hopefully you've heard of. Um, and it is four octets um, that indicate where the thing actually is, where the computer actually is. One of the things that's happened is in what is IP version four, is that this space of numbers is nowhere near big enough for all the computers that we have. And when I say computer, I'm talking about your, you know, Nest, you know, temperature control in your house. I'm talking about your phone. I'm talking about a laptop. I'm talking about everything, right? Anything that needs to access the internet, at the end of the day, needs an IP address. So I want to say 15 years ago, 20 years ago, IP version six was rolled out. It is still largely unusable today um, because it has a bunch of like challenges with it. One it is way less human readable. So this isn't particularly human readable, right? But you can remember it, right? When you, you know, if you see this in one terminal window, you can remember it to type it in another. It's relatively all right, you know, so you can still deal with it. IPv6 is just like impossible. However, IPv6 is like quite, a, I think it's, it might be four hexadecimal. It might be even bigger. I can't remember exactly. I can't remember the details. It doesn't really matter to most programmers most of the time. It is a very interesting subject. Um, 
you know, how TCP IP works and like kind of digging through it. And I know I like read a ton about it like 20 years ago. Um, and so if you're interested, it's worth kind of digging into kind of one time for a deep dive uh, just for fun. But for the purposes of most software developers, you kind of don't really care except where you do. And that's what I wanted to talk about. So when you get scc.bu.edu and you type that into a web browser, say, it needs to get this IP address. So the first place it looks, and you may or may not be familiar with this, before DNS existed, there was a file called the host file, okay? And primarily this was on Unix uh, and, you know, and then it replicated onto Linux. Um, and it's in a directory called Etsy, which is pronounced Etsy, but is short for et cetera. So it's basically, it's all generally speaking the configuration stuff on Unix and Linux. And that's what goes in there as contrasted with USR, which is short for user, right? Which would be all the user stuff. Um, and as contrasted with like, I don't know, some other ones that, you know, dev, which is like all the devices and a bunch of other stuff. But basically the whole file system, there's actually a whole guide to what the file system should look like on Linux. Uh, it's called the Linux file system guide, intuitively enough. Um, so Etsy hosts. On Windows, uh, they've kind of manufactured this file. So you can find it in Etsy hosts, but it's like in kind of a weird place. So if you find it on your machine, I don't use Windows often enough to remember exactly where, but it does exist. So there is a file called the host file. On Mac, it'll be Etsy hosts, because Mac is based on BSD, which is uh, uh, Berkeley something something, um, but it's kind of like similar to Unix, but it's another derivative of Unix uh, like Linux, but not the same. So it's also an Etsy host. Why do I bring this up? Because it, back in the early days, right, there was no DNS. And so the way you found another computer, if you didn't want to have to remember this number all the time, is you typed it into the host file. Okay, so you gave it a name on the left, or actually the syntax is different depending on what operating system you're on. So check, there's always an example at the top. So you want to clone that, whatever it is. So you gave it a name and you gave it the number. So once you found out what your friend's computer was, you went and got the IP address for it and then you typed it into the host file, all right? Uh, this predates even myself, okay? So I'm ancient, but I'm not that ancient. So Etsy host, the result for us today is that it is still the first place that is looked at in domain name resolution, okay? So in other words, if I type in an IP address into that file and map it to a name, I can give it whatever I want. Does that make sense? So the reason this is relevant for developers is because if you give it whatever you want, that means that you can fake it while you're doing some sort of development or something. So by extension, the SD host file is the first place it's looked. Then what's called a, a local DNS resolver or a local DNS server. So there will be some cache of some kind on your machine that keeps track of these for all the ones you look at. This is also particularly relevant for a developer because when you stand up a new website, let's say, or a new you know, URL at an IP address, this cache might be wrong. Okay, so you gotta keep in mind that you have a cache. And to make it more fun, is that this is cache is kind of inconsistent because a browser like Firefox doesn't trust your operating system to cache well enough or whatever. So they'll have their own cache. Okay, so everybody in their brother has a cache around. And the only way to clear them, usually because it's not really consumer oriented, is to actually kill the application and restart it. Um, you know, this is actually one of the reasons why you kind of end up having to reboot when you're a programmer, right? It's like, I just, I can't figure it out. I don't know who's got this thing cached or whatever. I'm just gonna turn off the computer and turn it back on again. So I know that'll clear the cache, right? So there's a local DNS resolver um, in Linux land. This is actually actively changing what's doing this uh, with much detrimental side effects. Um, but let's say it can't find it in its local cache. Then it goes out to what's called a root DNS server, okay? And the root DNS servers uh, are basically uh, by letter. Uh, 
And the first thing they do is they go to kind of the rightmost or broadest uh, location, okay? So you have like EDU, okay? So that's all the education system. Then you have COM, which originally was all the companies. And you used to have NET, which was all the stuff that was um, related to the internet. So if you were an ISP or something, you would have a .NET address. Um, .gov is government, but of course it's only US government um, because reasons. Um, and then you also have like country domains. So you'll see like .uk, but all of those are what are referred to up here often as TLDs, okay? Or top level domains. And they're served by the root DNS servers. And that part is quite a bit more complicated than I'm glossing over at the moment. But for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. The point being, it finds the EDU, then it goes ask the name server for that at BU for, so basically it says, oh, EDU, I know where BU is. Then it has its own name server. And I ask it where FCC one is. That would be, that's the correct URL that I meant to fix over there and forgot. But so it's actually FCC one. And then this returns this IP address. And then you're off on your merry way. All right, so a very brief, very, very brief introduction to DNS. Um, one of the things that's being introduced probably slowly is what's called secure DNS, where there's actually some cryptographic verification of this process. Because right now, like much of the old school internet, it just trusts everybody to be totally cool. So everybody will be fine. So DNS poisoning is a huge thing uh, or can be. It's such a sophisticated hack that most people, that you don't see it a lot, but it's very doable. So security and is starting to come in place. But again, unless you're kind of in this space, it doesn't really matter to you too much. Um, but long story short, uh, DNS for you as developers can be, you can, you can help yourself essentially by using like the host file, or you can shoot yourself in the foot by not realizing that you've cached something that you need to get a refresh on, okay? The other thing, because of how this stuff works, is you can also end up with some cool websites um, like, and one of them went away and the other one is, has taken its place. So I don't know if it's actually gonna work. Yeah, I think it's, is this a new one? Hopefully this isn't the questionable website. Okay, so, the original one was called Zip.io with an X. I don't know what happened to them, uh, but there's been a bunch of clones. And so this one, I'm not uh, you know, recommending this one over any other. It's the one I happen to remember. Um, what this does is it will actually fake DNS for you so that you, you know, if you have like a web server, an API server, you want the one to connect to the other, you can actually just feed this a name like a DNS name, and in the name is embedded the IP address that you want it to return, right? So if you're running this all on your local computer and you have a bunch of VMs or a bunch of containers, and you want to be able to talk to each other, but you want them to do it by name, that's where sites like this come in is you can just set this up as your DNS server and it'll just give you back whatever you asked it for so that you can just kind of set up that, that environment. Um, so super handy <laughs> for, for those kinds of scenarios. Um, but so this is a little bit of a, you know, kind of ancillary thing where like, but understanding how DNS roughly works will definitely, like I said, make your life less painful as a programmer, especially because we don't really do systems anymore that are not uh, multi-server, right? They just, they don't really exist anymore. So I'll go back to the slides. Um, you know, there's a couple of other services that are like this. Um, there's a really good one. I'm totally blanking on the name, which will actually uh, punch back through your firewall so that you can do this stuff across the broader internet, um, which is also super slick uh, and also free, which is also nice. But maybe we'll talk about that in a future class. Long story short, it's important to understand how DNS works at least to a rudimentary level. 
All right, and so related to that, it's important to understand how HTTP works. Does anybody know what HTTP stands for? Hypertext Correct, Mundo. All right, so does anybody know what hypertext is? That's a really fun one. Does anybody know what HTML stands for? Hint, hint. Mark up. But, yes. So Markdown, are you all familiar with Markdown? Uh, Markdown is actually a play on words. Uh, so when you want to embed data or metadata into a document, you use what's called a markup language. These have been around for a very long time. Uh, the oldest one I'm aware of is one that's called SGML, which I cannot remember what it stands for. Um, but a more common one that you may have all have seen before is called HTML. And what HTML does is it embeds display information primarily in the data, right? So you have your text, but then you have markup that indicates what to do with it when you want to display it. Markdown is a kind of a joke to say, we're simplifying your text by, because normally what you'd use is a word processor to give it like headlines and stuff. Oh, let me, you, most of you said you were not familiar with Markdown, right? Right, okay, so. Markdown is amazing. I strongly recommend it. Um, so what it does is lets you format a document like you had done it in like Microsoft Word but in a way that is just text. So you've probably, oh, this is doing well. I got a load. Is Markdown its own language or is it just a, is it like a type of language? Uh, it's as much a language as HTML is. Okay. So it's not really a language per se, um, but yes. So as you can see, right, you might have done this yourself in like, you know, if you're sending an email or something, you don't want to use HTML in it or something. You just put a pound in front of something, right, to kind of give it more weight, right? You might use, uh, let me show the more common examples. Um, doop, 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 doop. This has got way too much detail. Um, you'll see this a lot. So, this one's funny because um, as an old school internet user, single star around something means bold to me, but in Markdown, single star means italics, double star means uh, bold. And then, but like if you, looking for like so many obvious stuff. Uh, oh, so list, that was the big thing I was looking for. You, I'm almost certain, right, at some point or another, you have used asterisks, right, to indicate a list of things, right? So all Markdown does is prescribe those tricks. Then you end up with a document that if you just look at it as text, you get a sense of its presentation format. But then because it is a language, it can actually be parsed and rendered. So let's see if I have, yeah. Um, let me just see if I have a quick example. Oh, actually, um, so you all at least got a little bit of experience with um, what we call it, GitHub. Um, and so readme.md, right? This is it, right? And this is the rendered version. So GitHub does this for you automatically. If you have a file called readme.md, it will render it like this whenever somebody hits in their browser. And I'm gonna try to close this as quickly as possible because it has the solution to the assessment. But you get the idea. And so VS Code actually has a built-in markdown viewer. That, so I can get the rendered version. And when you're reading like something really long, uh, it can be really nice. Um, but so that was our, our brief sojourn into Markdown. But going back to the slides, so Hypertext Transfer Protocol was developed to transfer 
a hypertext markup language or the content therein, um, you know, back in the early days of the web. And the key difference between kind of any other attempt before that was that it had built in support for links. Okay, so it wasn't just blocks of text. You could actually have a block of text that was linked to another block of text. And that was is a big part of the web explosion. So the thing about HTTP, <coughs> excuse me, is that <coughs> unlike many protocols, it is completely stateless. Okay. And so you make from your client, you make a request to the server that understands HTTP in the version that you want. Um, if you ever want to experience this directly, uh, does anybody here ever use Telnet? You know what Telnet is? So it's getting very, very uncommon because Telnet is very, very insecure. But, sorry. <coughs> Talking makes me call. Um, <coughs> so what Telnet lets you do is you can actually Telnet to an HTTP server and you can pretend to be a client and send it commands and get it back. But that's where you might see the, the exposed to the actual version of HTTP that you're using. Um, because most of the time it doesn't come up. Uh, there's only been two, so it's not exactly, you know, huge differences. Point being, client makes a request to the server, server responds. Great. Okay. That is a stateless request because request response, right? Which is different from an expectation of this kind of scenario, right? So uh, request response. Yay. Do you remember me? No, I do not. I am a stateful pro stateless protocol. Okay. Why why do you think it's a stateless protocol? What what's the advantage? Because obviously that has some pain, right? So if you want to do, you know, like a form that's got a series of questions, you know, each on its own web page, it'd be nice if you could have state between them, right? So you could remember what was your answer to question A versus question B. So why would you make it stateless? Exactly, significantly lower overhead. So the reason, well, I'm sure there's other reasons, but one of the big reasons that HTTP is stateless is because it's less hard on the server. So now this server can serve orders of magnitude more clients than it could have had to keep track of state. All right. So, and the, th the reason I point this out, right, is that your experience doing any web development of any kind most likely has state, right? So have you ever done a website that had a login, for example, right? That uses state, right? You've got to remember who that user was. So that is state. The way the state is managed is by, <clears throat> sorry, um, is by what's called a session, okay? But the session is actually not being offered by the web server itself. <clears throat> it's in the software that's sitting on top of it. So the web server, the thing that is doing the HTTP, doesn't know anything about your session. And this is where cookies come from. Okay. So what you do is you pass around a cookie. Everybody know what a cookie is? Yes? Raise your hand if you know what a cookie is. And not the kind you eat. Um, what is particularly funny about cookies back in the old days, they don't really talk about it much anymore, is that uh, your storage area for cookies was always a cookie jaw, which I found like, let's, let's just go over the top on this terrible joke. Um, so uh, the way, so, and, and if you've never done this before, you should go into your browser and look at the cookies, go to the preferences in whichever browser you prefer, um, you know, and then find the area where the cookies are and look at the cookies. Like you will have, usually three to five per website, especially with ones that have a login. Those cookies are a way for the server to pass information back to the client that isn't meant to be interpreted by the user. For example, a session ID, okay? So the session ID gets passed back. Then the next time you make the call, you pass the session ID with the call. And then the software that's sitting up here, right? Or up here or whatever, um, says, oh, I got a session ID. I know who this person is. So it doesn't have to do this. So you can have state. All right. So as a result, and if you kind of extrapolate from the earlier point, if you have a site that has state, 
has a login, whatever, it's going to have require more resources than one that doesn't. Okay, and this is a very interesting phenomenon because there are lots and lots of sites that keep track of you and your session via cookie, even if you don't have a login. Um, and there's all kinds of different tricks to this. Uh, if you are interested in that sort of thing, you should really check out on what's called an Ever Cookie, uh, which is a way of making sure that the client user's cookie never disappears so that you can always track them. Um, we thought a friend of mine invented it only to discover that it had been in use for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, we were, we were disappointed. Um, we, had, we had good intent. All right. So one of the things that happened with HTTP is that, you know, like a lot of things that happen in software, not very good programmers came along and made a lot of websites. Okay. They didn't understand this whole stateless thing and why you would do stateless. They didn't understand why HTTP would have multiple commands. Okay, so as you're maybe familiar with, right? So there's actually get and post and delete and list, whatever the last one is. I can never remember the last one because it's the default. Um, wait, yeah, get, what are this? There's four of them, get, post, put, right, and delete, sorry. <clears throat> so, uh, so basically the reason there are those four verbs is because they're different operations. But nobody really understood this, didn't understand stateless, didn't understand why those verbs were there. So they just built everything with gets. Okay. Along, I don't know, maybe probably closer to 15 years ago now, um, this movement around what's called rest or restful. Um, now, can I remember what rest stands for? It is an acronym. Don't know if I can remember what it stands for. Um, but the idea with rest was that let's use those verbs the way they were intended so that we can lower the traffic that we're sending. So in other words, if I send a get and say, I want you to do a put when you get there, that's a lot less efficient than sending a put. Does that make sense? So that's basically what the whole rest movement was about. Is let's, let's take it back and start using HTTP more like it was intended to be used um, and go from there. And that has led to a lot of, you know, kind of applications and all that stuff that are significantly more scalable than they could have been without using those techniques. So RESTful APIs also give an advantage for humans in that when you have a RESTful API, you can guess what the operations are on it based on packets, right? You can, you know, you know that if you give, uh, the, uh, the name of something, like the type of something, and then a particular index, and then you do a put to it, you can change it, right? Like you can guess what they'll look like. Uh, the other thing is because they're so consistent, you can also generate documentation, so you don't have to guess, but it will actually make nice documentation. Uh, this is how things like uh, Swagger work, for example. Um, and this, of course, is always, there's a re relevant SKCD. Um, and I'm trying to remember what the point is. Um, yeah, so it, it's basically, yeah. So the, it, this is the API documentation where um, you will commonly see it's just Swagger generated. So you get this whole, whole nice website of documentation and everything but it literally doesn't tell you anything that you couldn't have guessed from looking at the URLs. It doesn't tell you the why, because the computer can't extrapolate that, right? All it knows is that there's an index here and there's a you know, put there and that kind of stuff. So that's what, what this is trying to get at. All right, does that make sense so far? All right. So how did we get here a little bit, right? So back in the day, you know, even, uh, well, not entirely, you know, I have actually worked on software systems that look like this, where you had kind of a number of clients, then you have like a central system that is the one that does the big processing, okay? This is usually referred to as a, a client server architecture, okay? Not to be confused with a client only architecture. Uh, so, just trying to think of a good example. So like, 
uh, one of the classic examples of something that was just a big iron piece of software that didn't you know, communicate with the server at all was uh, trading desks. So like stock trading. So I would have the stock trading app on my desktop and it would literally directly go and make those trades in, you know, yes, you used APIs, but they weren't operated by my bank or any of that stuff. It was operated by the, uh, the exchange. But the whole thing would run locally. The downside being the whole thing ran locally, right? Uh, another big one is, uh, but this one's harder to separate, was uh, oil and gas research is another big one that the big fat clients but so client server architecture, you put a server in place so that you can basically scale up that server while keeping your client software or hardware relatively cheap, right? So you can give everyone a laptop because when they need real juice, they go to the shared computing cluster, right? Or they go to AWS or whatever. But the idea being is that when you wanna scale that resource, you can do it in one place without having to scale as horizontally from a monetary perspective, not a technical one. So that was the idea behind the client server architecture. I don't have to buy big beefy clients everywhere. I can put all the money in the server and then have cheap, lightweight clients. <laughs> that graduated into what's referred to as a three-tier architecture. Although I think a three-tier architecture actually existed in the real world for like a hot minute and quickly became an N-tier architecture. Okay, and the reason we make the distinction is because of two things. From a, a human understanding perspective, a three-tier architecture, like it makes sense. You have this presentation layer, you have this logic layer, and then you have this data layer, okay? But in practice, it is very rare that you only have one computer doing each of these things, or even like one set of software that's doing presentations here. Just as a simple example, right? If you think about a website, you think about your web browser versus the server, okay? So both of those are developing presenta presentation tier stuff, right? Because what it's gonna do, so the web server is actually gonna go to the database and collect all the books you've ever read, okay? And then it's gonna shove that into some HTML, then it's gonna ship that HTML down to the client, then the client is actually gonna render, it, okay? But then on top of that, you might actually have some local processing, JavaScript, right? Where the client, the browser needs to do its own work on the presentation tier. So just the presentation tier, which theoretically should be the simplest, has at least multiple computers involved. Logic layer, like that'll be sometimes even worse, right? Especially as you get into more shared services where, you know, my logic tier is there, but, um, you know, if I'm doing an e-commerce site, nobody in their right mind does their own credit card processing, right? You, you, you ship it off to Stripe or authorize.net or something like that. So that's a whole different, there's not only multiple computers involved, there's multiple vendors, okay? Then the data tier is the same, uh, sort of, in that <clears throat> in a, in a well-designed data tier, you'll actually have what are called like big data lakes or you know, all the data kind of uh, well stored in a very safe way, but in a very expensive to access way, all right? And so then what you do is stick in front of that, you'll stick what's often referred to as a data mark, which has been, uh, you know, has moved the data around in such a way that it's easy to consume for the logic tier. So then you get more computers, right? Um, and then as we were talking about Seth the other day, um, so now in the data tier, there's even these uh, technologies which, take um, disparate storage from all over the place and present it as single storage. One of the projects, one of the open source projects that does this is called CEPH, C-E-P-H. Did I talk about that with you or somebody? No, it was you. Um, so, uh, so CEPH, there's another one called Bluster. Um, and that's what's probably actually happening behind uh, like AWS resources when you buy storage, right? So, now you see why it's in fact N tier, but we talk about it usually in terms of three tier, it's a lot more understandable. Um, this is also largely fallen by the wayside um, because it's, it's, not, it's still just not sophisticated enough. So, um, oh, I think I forgot I had this slide. So this basically just talks about the same thing. Um, 
And I just want to see if I missed anything. Um, no, that should be good. All right. So, you know what I don't have? I don't think is a microservices slide. Well, okay. So, the next thing we would talk about is if, if we think about all the things I mentioned in these various pieces, right? Think of them as individual services, right? So, you have your credit card processing, or you have your stock trading, or you have your, um, you know, it could be just an adder and subtractor widget and, you know, whatever. But you have all these different pieces that come together into an individual application. Okay, and this is where wording gets really difficult um, because like a service means it provides some sort of function. It is an application, right? But then the collection of services is also referred to as an application. And the idea with the services, and there's a very famous um, Bezos uh, memo to Amazon you know, engineering where he outlined, uh, you know, first of all, he's gonna break the teams up into what they call two person teams, uh, sorry, two pizza teams. And a two pizza team, anybody guess what that means? Correct. So, you know, call it eight ish, right? So that's a two pizza team. Um, the two pizza teams will build services that are consumed by other two pizza teams. Okay. So, whatever that service might be. Maybe it's a uh, check for inventory on this pair of boots, okay? Or actually, check for inventory, really, right? And then you pass in what you're looking for. And some other team is doing the service that is, um, you know, buy a pair of boots, right? So when the website needs to first find out if the boots are there and then actually purchase it, they have to call two different services. So that's kind of the microservice architecture, right? Is that you have individual components that do one thing well. But Bezos did another thing which made it particularly interesting and set them up for this, like how immensely uh, successful AWS has been, which was not only should the service uh, be consumable internally, but it must also be consumable externally. That doesn't mean it will be public, but it must work like it could be. What does that let them do? All of a sudden, now inventory can be made exposed to any website on the internet, right? If they so desire. So, brilliant strategy, worked really well. I, I would argue, I don't know who else does, but I would argue this had a lot to do with AWS's success because they could just pull these services out of the box that were already built, they're already set up to be externally consumed. Bang, you know, you're done. So, that's the idea behind a service architecture. Okay, so you take all these different services. Um, uh, let's say 10, 15 years ago, um, this service architecture idea caught on and became referenced as SOA or service oriented architecture, which makes a lot of sense. The thing was, is that the way it was rolled out into organizations is what they usually refer to as like a top down approach. So a group of architects would sit around and say, here are all the services we're going to build, and they would step through it. And if you remember the waterfall methodology we were talking about before, they would build all those requirements, then design the whole thing, then release it for implementation. This went terribly for the vast majority of cases. Just never got out of the design phase because they couldn't keep up, right? So to separate themselves and make it popular again and have a new buzzword, they introduced microservices. Microservices and services and service-oriented architectures turn away are essentially the same thing. They aren't really that much smaller or anything else than a well-designed service in an SOA environment. The difference is instead of the top-down approach for creating them all, they created them as they needed them from the bottom up. Generally speaking in software development, building things only as you need them using agile methods works better, is more successful, then building, then coming up with requirements first, and then building it. Even though all, over time, the service or, like mechanisms, the microservice mechanism, generally is more expensive. The outcome is better, and and enough better that it outweighs the expense. All right, that was a lot. Make sense? Okay. So, next we come to the next hot new term. Okay, which is a serverless architecture. Does anybody know what a serverless architecture is? Does anybody use any serverless functions? 
All right. So serverless, you've all heard of serverless though, right? Yes, raise hands. Bueller, wake up, everybody. All right, so serverless is kind of the next step on that microservice journey, okay? In that a service is now so autonomous that it can just be out there on its own and doing its thing. And the reason they call it serverless is because there's nothing that you manage aside from the code that you write that performs the service, okay? And so much like cloud computing, which, you know, uh, I don't think I have this picture in this deck. There's a great t-shirt, right? Which is cloud computing. I use other people's computers, right? That, that's what cloud really is, is that there's a whole host of computers in a data center somewhere that AWS rents to me when I ask for it. There are computers, there is no cloud. It's just computers of other people that I'm borrowing or renting. Um, and as uh, a really good talk I saw a few years ago at uh, OSCON talked about nothing new has been invented since like 79. Um, if you know anything about mainframes, they work the same way. So that's what's particularly funny. But serverless is that next step, okay? Where I write some code and then I don't know anything about the environment it's sitting in. I just rent resources to make my code run. And that's what a serverless architecture is, making that service even more autonomous. Um, and serverless is, is young enough that you still have to know kind of how some of this bit works, okay? But uh, Amazon calls them Lambda functions. Uh, Google calls them, I think, just functions. Azure, I want to say, does similar. The going term is starting to be function and Lambda, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they changed the name of it because most people find it kind of confusing. <laughs> um, did anybody here use a Lambda in Python? Okay, so Lambdas is a, is a Python like coding technique, I guess. Like, I, don't, I don't know what else to describe it as, but I, I'm certain that's where the term comes from. Um, but you basically you shove your code in and then whenever somebody calls it, it actually spins up something to execute that code that gives you the results, all right? And these days that's often a container um, because container um, like from zero to running is near zero time. So you can do it very fast. But the thing is, if you have a Lambda function or any other kind of function uh, that is infrequently used, its launch time will be relatively poor. Right, because they got to spin up the hardware that it's on. So it's something to keep in mind, but they're really, really useful, especially in scenarios where you have a service that is infrequently used, right? So you don't want to keep it running all the time because nobody's using it, or that you don't know how often it's going to be used, right? So you pop it up and you're like, I don't know, maybe it's going to be used every minute, maybe every three days. It doesn't matter because it's infinitely scalable, both from zero, but also to the million because they're just running your code and they're gonna spin up infrastructure to run that piece of code. So if they're not already, uh, I, I would suspect that serverless um, architectures are probably the next big thing, right? The next thing that we're gonna see them move to. But again, it's just services, just in like deployed in such a way that they're really autonomous so that they can be nearly infinitely scalable. Um, and then there's terminology that goes to that too. Um, there's a lot of things that are, are labeled event sources. And really what that means is that somebody is kind of offering, uh, you know, an inbound API. So like I'm sending an event rather than consuming something from you. I'm going to send an event in a format that's kind of well understood, kind of like HTTP, like with put, for example, but it's in a format that's well understood so that the Lambda function can easily consume it. So you have these kind of API interfaces on both sides that make it much easier to, to consume these events. But those events can be completely arbitrary, um, but you're seeing them from things like Apache Spark to, uh, you know, there's like, they're just coming out the woodwork. Um, but have you ever used uh, if this, then that? So same idea as that, 
Um, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's kind of cool. Uh, there's a lot of competitors now, but they were the first. All right, does that make sense? So literally we just keep saying the exact same thing. We're just taking functionality of code, primarily that logic tier, breaking it up into something like a service. And then we're making the service more and more autonomous so that we can scale the services based on need for that individual piece of functionality. And we can tie them together in new and different ways, right? If you tie your inventory checker to your price or to your buy the thing checker, then you can't ever, uh, you know, write another service that does, you know, uh, inventory management because you always have to buy something when you call the inventory. So that's why you want to break these things up. You break them up into logical functions. And then you end up with, you get all the way out to something like serverless. And more long words. Um, this has also resulted in a whole fun series of acronym soup, okay? Um, but they largely end in AAS, okay? So the first one was IAAS, which to the best of my knowledge, nobody tries to pronounce, which is infrastructure as a service. So that is EC2, okay? Um, then you also have, the, actually the granddaddy really is SaaS, which is SAAS, which is software as a service. So are you all familiar with Salesforce? That's the far, far and away the prime example. I go pay some money, I use their software, nothing is ever installed on my machine. Software as a service. Um, and then you're start like, because it's like, I wanna be cool, so I'm gonna come up with some sort of acronym. So you have like backend as a service, you have functions as a service, you have, I don't know, think of something, there's probably one as a service. So if you see these 99.9% .9 of the time, it's whatever the thing you care about is as a service, okay? And this is important, right? Because when you're building software, um, increasingly you're, you're getting services from all over the place that are providing the vast majority of your application functionality. And if you're not aware of kind of the ecosystem of available services, you're writing a whole bunch of services that you didn't need to. And particularly in like a startup scenario, MVP scenario, you want to write the smallest amount of code you possibly can because you want to get it out the door as fast as possible. So keeping aware of that ecosystem is very, very useful. Um, yeah, so there's a, you know, can be a performance overhead, right? Because now you have all this communication between all these different services. And this is true both in the microservice scenario, but also in serverless. Um, as well as the one specific to serverless, which is that going from zero to first launch can be quite expensive. Um, and then microservices have a huge problem with exposed attack surface because now you need everybody who's working on a service to have sophisticated security consciousness, right? Unless you can give them a way to do it without it. I would actually argue that Microservices have that quite a lot, but uh, serverless applications or serverless functions really, it can be reduced because there's like only one way in and out of a serverless function. Um, and so it can, be, it can be less, not always, but often. All right, so I like this comparison of languages because I think it's funny. But mostly the reason I throw this up here is two things. Um, let's say I run an engineering or a, you know, an IT shop, right? And we're making a big investment in um, you know, some new software. And we're trying to decide whether that new software should be written in Java or in C Sharp. If you were the consultant, as I was many a time, <laughs> and they asked you, should I use Java or C-sharp for this application? How would you figure out the answer? 
what would you what would you tell the CEO or IT department head? Yeah. I'm still in first year and I figure out what they're trying to do because some languages are better than others. So figuring out their use cases is really important. So that is a hundred percent true and completely the wrong answer. So why is it the wrong answer? Because you are you are completely correct. It is much better to use Python for certain scenarios, Java versus C++ versus Go versus Rust, whatever you have to like today. Various scenarios, different languages definitely favor different ones. For the vast majority of business level applications, those differences are relatively moot. Okay, so at least between like Java and C sharp, right? Uh, the differences between like uh, you know like Haskell and Go are quite extreme you know, if you're trying to compare those two. The right answer is what, do you have more Java developers or C Sharp developers on staff already? And where, and how easy is it for you to hire more? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't really make that much difference. However, to your earlier point, when you're talking about a service oriented architecture, what happens is you get now the luxury of being able to choose languages for a job. So let's say you have 100 Python developers and three Go developers, okay? For the vast majority of the work in your services, you should build them in Python. Then while you're doing your system, you will notice if you're doing observability correctly, you'll notice you'll get certain hotspots. You should have that team of three developers come and rewrite that service in Go. Following, like so, whatever your vast majority of the people you have or the people you think you can hire, that's kind of what you should do the vast majority of your code in. But if you're doing this service oriented architecture, whether it's serverless or microservices or whatever, you know, the flavor of the week is of that style, you leverage that luxury to now take your expensive or rare resources and point them at that problem, right? Just like you do with hardware, right? You don't you don't throw your really high end GPU servers into anything besides a machine learning problem. Right, because they're just being wasted. Same idea so. Um, I also think this is funny too, because neither of these are actually a language. Um, they're called languages, but they actually are not you know you can't program with them. Um, but they're kind of cool so. Let's see. I think that's all on that one. Um, and hey, look, I keep forgetting I have a slide that's got a bunch of the notes of what I was going to say. Um, it's like I prepared these in advance. Uh, so, a couple of things that we want to talk about here, okay, is now this is getting into specifically for your project, okay? Um, we are as a team, so as Spark, right? We are comfortable with a certain number of languages and frameworks, et cetera. And so we would rather you work in one of those because then we can help you. But if you decide to go and write your project in Haskell, not only am I gonna kick you, but on top of that, we can't help you, okay? Um, I'm mostly just give Haskell a hard time. It's actually really good for certain kinds of scenarios, uh, but it is fun to make fun of. Um, so, and actually a good example of this is uh, Rust in popularity. Rust is definitely going up in popularity. Um, I have some significant issues with it, mostly because it's um, it's only kind of sorta of GA'd. So it's still got a lot, uh, it's still got a lot of growing to do before I would trust it in production. Um, but that's a good example of, I'd rather you didn't do something in Rust, even if it is a pretty good choice because we can't help you. So what we largely do is Python, um, and we largely do Python with Flask and with um, uh, Fast API, uh, and Node.js, and so by extension JavaScript. Um, and then kind of on the front end, uh, we're pushing towards React. Um, oh, we do have some Django uh, systems as well. Um, some of this will be dictated by whatever the existing project is in, right? But some of the projects are net new code, so. That would be where you'd be more making a choice more. Um, this is one of my pet peeves of the world. You'll probably hear me complain about it. 
but Node.js plus Express becomes a web server and actually acts like this, but Node.js is really not supposed to be a web server at all. Completely misused design. Um, so we're largely just pushing React these days. Like we're seeing nothing in Angular anymore. Um, so we prefer you stick with React. Uh, and then, oh, and then on the back end, um, you know, uh, basically database server, we're pushing towards uh, Postgres. Um, and so we would prefer you use that unless you have a really good reason to do something else. Um, uh, on the NoSQL front, MongoDB is usually the right answer. Uh, do be careful with MongoDB because if you drop the DB, it is a offensive term in most of South America. Um, so good, good product name choice there. Um, so yeah, that's it. Make sense? All right. And we have a whole document for this uh, that explains it kind of in more detail. It's on GitHub and we can, uh, you know, I'll share it after class. Maybe I'll post it as the opt-in note or something. Um, I think when I wrote these slides the first time, we didn't have the document. So um, I had forgotten. All right. Um, so yeah, so talking about persistence, um, One of the things I like to ask is, okay, does anybody here know what the difference is besides the really, really obvious between a SQL database and a NoSQL database? And I don't mean one uses SQL. NoSQL is like document based. So like everything that you need is like listed in one document, whereas like SQL is relationship based. So like all the data, like you will have to like um, check the relationships, check the tables to build up out the whole data. That's one of the best answers I've heard in a very long time. Uh, any other color anybody wants to add? Okay, so that's exactly right. Uh, what most people call NoSQL databases now are what used to be called document stores and in combination with key value pair caches or key value pair stores. Uh, for some reason, they got lumped together some number of years ago into this label of NoSQL. Um, they serve completely different purposes. So that's why I really don't understand why they got grouped together. But you're exactly right. So think of the document store side of um, NoSQL. So things like MongoDB. The idea of it is you don't care about the uh, kind of data inside an individual document very much. So this is why a MongoDB is great for like a product page for your pair of boots, right? Because you don't really care whether that pair of boots, you know, was made in Italy or that it's, um, you know, I don't know, that it's, uh, it's been around for 10 years or whatever. Like you're not going to ever be searching for boots made in Italy, <clears throat> probably. I mean, maybe there's some websites that might, but, you know, in general, there's a lot of information about like a product that that you don't need to know what the information that it's information right versus just like text. So a document store is really good for that. Um, it particularly happens one of the things actually I think we have a slated project for is something like oh no it's direct to study but is like meeting minutes from uh, this board you know a government board and so that government board meets every so often they produce meeting minutes the vast majority of the data in the meeting minutes, no one cares about, right? There are certain elements that you do, like who was there, what decisions were made, right? But whether or not they have a conversation about whether they had a snack before they came to the meeting, we don't care about, right? You may in some circumstances, that's why we keep the whole document, but largely we don't care about it. So we only wanna be able to extract certain kinds of information out of it. So we store it in a document store. And that's what they're good at. They store documents in ways that uh, you don't really care about the insides of the data. The other gross class of NoSQL databases are key value pair uh, caches or key value stores, or they have a lot of different names. Um, but basically they're kind of exactly what they sound like, and they're similar to a document store, but usually the value is significantly smaller than a document. So a key value is think like, y'all know what a hash table is? Think like a hash table, right? You have a key that finds the thing, 
and then somewhere at the other end is you know the value whatever it is you're looking for um etcd is probably the most prominent one of these um although not used by most of you probably because you don't really use it in websites but it is the back end for kubernetes for example um one of the other big ones uh, that is used in websites a lot is like redis um which is not in this picture um i don't know here um it was another key value structure so basically they're really really good at kind of hash table type things where you have a whole bunch of keys and you want to go find some smallish piece of data about it as you might imagine right you could use them interchangeably but it's it's a little weird they obviously are going to optimize one or the other uh whereas a sql store to your earlier point the relationships matter so in other words all the elements are data okay and you can mimic a document store in a sql database just fine that's where has anybody ever heard of a clob or a blob uh data storage object okay so uh their blob is binary large objects clob is character large object um most databases have that as like a data type so what you do is you stick your document in the blob or clob depending on how you want to store it um and what it actually does is keeps a pointer and then writes a file to disk they are not as efficient as something like mongo um especially like mongo what it'll let you do oh sorry mongodb what it'll let you do is actually it will find data inside the documents um it's just slower whereas like postgres using a clob it's probably not going to have any particular facility to do that uh let's see so that's most of data storage um where where it also starts to get more sophisticated um is things like hadoop right where now you want to transform that data in kind of a bulk way um are you familiar with hadoop all right so hadoop is a piece of software uh that does the map reduce algorithm um but at scale right uh and usually in a batch way so i want to do a big map reduce problem and i run it overnight and every day i get a bunch of new data and i need to do the map reduce problem again overnight uh hadoop is a engine for doing that um but so that's where you start get playing in the big data space uh if that makes sense yeah uh, what's the map reduce it's an algorithm uh it's for it's like when you want to like it's part of machine learning kind of where it's like you want to extract like information out of a large data set but first you have to map it to each other and then reduce it down and then usually loop until you get to the thing you're looking for um it's one of those things like if i can think of a good example off the top of my head it'd make a lot more sense but i'm not thinking of a good example so but yeah that's that's what it's for generally in the kind of machine learning phase or like data crunching of various sorts um apache spark is the real-time version of the same thing same idea but it does it off streams rather than big batches all right so as i mentioned before uh we prefer you go with postgres or with mongodb uh one of the tricks for new websites um this is where i'm like okay with document storage like I don't actively dislike them. I just don't like things when they're used without understanding why people are using them. But something like Mongo, MongoDB is a great way to start a website because you don't know what relationships you ultimately care about. Um, and so as a result, if you kind of store like everything about a user as one big document, you can then go back two years from now when you realize that you really care about eye color and extract that data and put it into something like a SQL database. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it's a great way to kind of just collect the information when you're not sure what relationships you actually care about. Uh, so, and a common way to start websites is actually to use both, is that you have the things you know you care about the relationships, right? So users and their logins, right? Um, and something where you're not sure what you care about, you know, all your product descriptions and actually just have a combination of the two. Um, and I think I've largely talked about this, but um, 
Oh, and then, oh, sorry, lastly, I didn't mention ORMs. Um, uh, has anybody used an ORM before? You probably have. Uh, you ever heard of SQL Alchemy? Um, so SQL Alchemy is an ORM. Uh, for people who are familiar with Red Hat, uh, they have a super famous one that I'm blanking on the name of. Um, starts with an H, so I'm thinking Hadoop, but I can't think of it's really. Hibernate. Uh, that's the Java, uh, big Java one. Uh, obviously, there's lots of competitors in the space, but SQL Alchemy, everybody uses that with Python. Hibernate, everybody uses that with Java. But what they do is let you have an object in your language or whatever, and then it generates its relationship to the database. Okay, so when I have a user, I just can say store on the object, and it will write it into the database correctly. Why is this an advantage? Well, a couple things. One, uh, you probably aren't going to write better SQL than it does. Number one. Number two. Um, if you decide you want to move that data around, your ORM is kind of your lingua franca between databases, both SQL and NoSQL for some of them, depends on the ORM. Um, but so invariably you will have a better time if you use an ORM um, because it will do this mapping for you, which makes your life a lot less painful because at the end of the day, right? Remember the reason we have Python and the reason we have SQL is because they don't do the same thing well, to your earlier point, right? I think it was you. Um, so SQL is a set-based language. It's very good at operating on sets. Um, it does not map well to an object-oriented or general purpose language, right? But like the, they're just not the same. You can do it, but they're not the same. Um, so an ORM is a piece of software built to do that mapping as efficiently as possible. So that's why they're super nice. As well as another concept, which you didn't really talk about, I have one minute to talk about it in maybe, um, which is what's called, or typically called migrations. So one of the things that happens with software a lot, right, is that the structure of your data changes over time. Um, in one of them, it can be a really obvious way in that you have maybe a test data set and you have a production data set. Those are different data sets, right? So if you manage those through what are usually referred to as migrations, um, and depending on the software, they'll, like, they almost all call it a migration, but then the different software have different flavors. But with migrations, what you can do is you can say, you know what, set up a, database, a test database. Oh, and then we actually move this field over there and that field over there, and we wanna populate this data this way. And you can articulate all that in your migrations. And then migrations, here's another one for you. Are you all familiar with the term item potent? So item potent is this kind of concept. I mean, it's a real word too, but in software where if I keep performing the same operation, nothing changes, okay? So an item potent operation is if I do it again, I still end up with the result that I, I did the first time. So it's the difference of, I set a value to five versus I set add one, right? So if I do add one over and over and over again, I'm gonna get a really big number, right? But if I do set five, I can do that forever and I would still have five. So that's an item potent operation. So the reason I mentioned item potent is because with migrations, the idea of them is that they're item potent. So you can always from any state you're in, run the migrations and end up in current state, whether that's because you brand new database or you broke the database. Um, and so now you wanna fix it, you can run the migrations, it'll bring you back to where you were. Uh, at least we didn't cover very much today. Let's see. Oh, I didn't even get to containers. Um, all right. Uh, lastly, I just wanna mention, uh, so mobile app development, um, obviously, all the database, API server, all that stuff is the same, uh, or usually the same. Um, our preferred language on the front end is, at the moment, Flutter, um, which is basically has the appeal of being cross-platform. So you write it in Flutter, and you can file for iOS or Android. Um, it's also backed by Google. It has great tutorials. Um, so we're leaning towards that, um, because otherwise, your choices are basically Java or Swift which have the huge downside of, unless you continue to be an iOS developer, Swift will never be valuable again. Um, so 
we push towards flutter uh i can't remember i can't remember if any of the apps for this semester already are using swift but if they are we would stick with swift if that makes sense but if you have a choice we're pushing towards flutter um and and the other thing we tend not to even though react native is very popular um we're shying away from it for two reasons one it's it's kind of clunky um but also because it is so actually dissimilar from react that it often causes people to confuse get confused trying to do react and react native um because they're even though they have the same name and they came from the same source they're not that similar uh at least in our opinion so so that's where we're going with that um we will cover containerization in a lot more detail anyway so we can we can skip that for today um any other questions all right uh that was a lot of information uh the video will be posted so you can review it um one of the things that i will say is that the one of the really hard things about teaching this class is i have to teach you a bunch of stuff that you can't use for weeks right so a lot of what i said today you're probably going to forget when you go and look at your projects so do go back and try to look at the lecture again look at the slides again uh, to help inform you about like kind of how you want to do that architecture that kind of stuff especially when you run into problems like you probably will with things like dns you know you have this here so um you know i i just don't know a way to teach it to you when you need it without also putting you so behind on actually doing the project that you'll be in trouble right so just keep that in mind the stuff i'm talking about will be relevant in a few weeks um more than it is at the moment so come back and look at it again if it helps all right thanks everybody Thank you.